Today, I feel compelled to discuss with you a matter of great importance. Several years ago, I was at a steakhouse uh, in Utah, in Salt Lake City. And five Mormon missionaries came in, and they're always very polite. They're very well-dressed, and they're usually about 20 years old. There were five of them which struck me as kind of odd. Uh, apparently, um, somebody had gone home, and so one of the missionaries was waiting for his new companion. Anyway, there were five instead of six, because normally they, they go two by two. And uh, as they walked in, I said, um, can I ask you elders a trick question? And that got their attention. They, they sat down and they said, sure. And um, I said, let me ask you a question. Um, uh, was God the Father once a man? In other words, as you are now, was he like you at one time? And can you become like him? And they said, yes, God was once a man like us. And I said, now, when he was a man, did he have a father that, that he prayed to? And they said, yes. I said, so I'm not trying to be a smart aleck, but it's safe to say that you have kind of like a grandfather God. And they kind of laughed and said, Okay, I think you could I think you could define it that way. And then I said, okay, and then Jesus Christ uh, was the firstborn. Your, uh, the, the God that you worship was once a man and he was elevated into, uh, into Godhood. And they said, correct. I said, and he has a lot of wives. And they said, correct. And I said, so for all you know, Jesus Christ is your older brother, but he may be your half brother or your full brother. And they kind of laughed and said, never really thought about that before. But yes, he could be um, my brother from another mother. <laughs> okay. I said, okay, so... Um, so, uh, so uh, is Jesus Christ now a God? And they said, yes. And I said, and how many, how many gods are there? Jesus Christ would be the son of Elohim, the God you pray to, and he would have the grandfather God that Elohim uh, was raised by when he was once a man. And they said, yeah. I said, so how many gods are there? And they said, we don't know. There could be an there could be billions and trillions of, of gods we don't know. I said, okay, so just to be clear, um, Jesus is, is not the eternal God. He's, he's one of many eternal gods. And they said, yes, he's one of many eternal gods. They all agreed he was a god, but he was not the eternal god. I said, okay, so I said, um, I've got a Book of Mormon here. Uh, I said, uh, can you just please go to the very first page? Uh, where it says, you know, the Book of Mormon. And um, so they went to it, and I said, okay, um, I want you guys to tell me um, uh, to fill in the blank. I said, but, but before, before you look at it, fill in the blank. It says, the purpose of the Book of Mormon <clears throat> is for the convincing quote of the Jew and Gentile that Jesus is the Christ. I said, do, do you agree with that? And they said, yes. I said, then what does it say after that three words? And none of them knew. I said, the eternal God. So the purpose of the Book of Mormon is to convince the Jew and the Gentile that Jesus is the Christ, the eternal God. All of you guys just got done telling me he is not the eternal God, but one of many. And one of them stood up and got really angry and pointed at his finger and said, you tricked us. And in fairness to the other four, they said to him, Elder, he said he had a trick question. And so he calmed down and apologized. Uh, but the bottom line is most people do not know uh, their scriptures. They don't. Uh, they get in a group and they kind of parrot what the group says. And this was on the very first page. Now, I have asked that question to many, many, many Mormons over the years. And only one person ever filled in the blank. He was an LDS bishop. Uh, so again, the purpose of the Book of Mormon is for the convincing of the Jew and the Gentile that Jesus is the Christ, the eternal God. There you go, right there. I don't know a single Mormon who believes that Jesus Christ is the eternal God, not one. In fact, every Mormon I know believes that uh, after they die, um, they can become a God too. And, and, you know, Jesus will be their elder brother and he will have his piece of the universe and they can all get their own piece uh, of the universe. You know, in other words, as, as man is now, God once was, as God is now, man may become. Uh, now, I, same problem I have with people who call themselves Christians. I say, will you please tell me where in the Bible I can find the gospel of Jesus Christ? 
And they'll say it's the whole Bible. They'll say it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. No, I say I'm looking for just a clear definition, you know, where someone defines the gospel. Well, it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. And it says you will have eternal life if you if you stand on the knowledge of these three things. That if you trust three things and keep these three these three things in memory, how that Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Most, most people who call themselves Christians cannot tell you where the gospel of Jesus Christ is found in the Bible. Now I'm going to show you a clip from um, Mormon President Russell M. Nelson, and he's going to talk about the use of nicknames uh, in Mormonism and how and and how using nicknames is wrong. So if you're using the term LDS, uh, you should take a look at this. And um, and uh, anyway, uh, but again, it's it's not just an LDS thing. Um, you know, most people don't search the scriptures for answers. They kind of go with their current leaders say, and they sort of kind of obey them. And this is kind of the status of, of Christendom. Uh, and when I say Christendom, I mean anybody who puts Jesus Christ in the equation, whether they're wrong or not. Let's listen to Russell M. Nelson. Today, I feel compelled to discuss with you a matter of great importance. Do you use the term LDS? Do you use the term anti-Mormon? Do you use the term the church or the members? Or do you always say members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints? Do you always say that final term? Or do you, knew, do you use a nickname, especially the nickname LDS? If so, this is really for you because according to Russell M. Nelson, Every time you do that, you're scoring a major victory for Satan. And if we allow nicknames to be used or adopt or even sponsor those nicknames ourselves, he is offended. To remove the Lord's name from the Lord's church is a major victory for Satan. Let me start by telling you a true story that happened to me about 15 to 20 years ago when the internet was kind of you know, relatively new and they had chat groups. And the first chat group that I went into was the abortion room and I asked the question, uh, when, does, uh, when does life begin? And I was astonished at the viciousness and the hatefulness of the responses I got for simply asking a question. And so it dawned on me there were some people who simply will not reason. Uh, one sign of a person who has the truth is he or she will reason. And this is what Isaiah says, let us reason. How wonderful it is that we have a God that wants to reason with us. Uh, well, I thought, well, since I'm, a, since I'm a Mormon, let me go into a, a religion chat group. And there was a guy from the University of Wyoming, and uh, this guy knew his Bible. And um, I got a little frustrated with him, and I said, listen, uh, don't you think it's rather interesting that we are the only church on earth that is called the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints? We are the only church I know of that has Jesus Christ in the name. And he said, well, are you saying that if, if, you, if you had a different name, you would be a false church. And I was kind of silly enough to say, yeah, that might be the case. He goes, well, then let me inform you that um, in 1834 through 1838, your church wasn't even called the Church of Jesus Christ. It was called the Church of Latter-day Saints. And I said, no, that's, that's, that's false. And he gave me a link. To remove the Lord's name from the Lord's church is a major victory for Satan. And so I clicked on the link, and surely enough, um, it took me to the LDS website that said uh, in 1834, an official resolution was passed by the Mormon church that they would be called uh, the Church of Latter-day Saints. Take a look. I am here at uh, Wikipedia, and uh, it says this. It says, on May 3rd, 1834, the church, meaning the Mormon church, adopted a resolution. So Joseph Smith clearly would have been part of that. On May, May 3rd, 1834, the church adopted a resolution that 
it would be known thereafter as, quote, the Church of the Latter-day Saints. Okay, there you go. To remove the Lord's name from the Lord's Church is a major victory for Satan. When we discard the Savior's name, we are subtly disregarding all that Jesus Christ did for us, even his atonement. So let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 uh, through 2. And the Apostle Paul uh, begins this way. He says, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother. He says, unto the church of God. Well, there are three members of the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There are three members. It's the triune God. So he says unto the church of God. He doesn't say unto the church of Jesus Christ. He says unto the church of God, which is at Corinth. And then he says, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus. Why didn't Russell M. Nelson bring that in? Because as members in the body of Christ, we are sanctified in Christ Jesus. Why, why is, is, is his not doing that a major victory for Satan? And then it says, call to be saints with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and, and ours. So why don't apostles start with this verbiage when they address saints? Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Over the past several years, I've asked many returned missionaries at BYU the following question. How would you feel if I walked up to you and I said, I am the student at BYU? And uh, they kind of laugh and say, well, that would be silly because there's about, you know, there's more than 25,000 uh, students at BYU. Well, when you say to somebody, uh, I am a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, okay? And um, 1 Nephi 14.10 says there's only two churches, the Church of the Lamb of God, and whosoever does not belong to that church belongs to the Church of the Devil, the whore of the whole earth, the mother of abominations. This came from an angel, allegedly, sent by God to Nephi. Let me explain why we care so deeply about this issue. The name of the church is not negotiable. And so uh, make no mistake about it, when Mormons say they are members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, uh, they are being consistent with the first vision that said uh, Joseph Smith should join no church on earth according to God the Father and Jesus Christ who appeared before him because all their uh, creeds were abominations and all the professors were corrupt. And in Doctrine and Covenant section 1, um, uh, it says that the Mormon church is the only living and true church on the face of the planet. So the other churches are false and dead. When the Savior clearly states what the name of his church should be, and even precedes his declaration with, thus shall my church be called, he's serious. So according to Russell M. Nelson, when uh, Jesus Christ speaks, he's very, 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 very serious, and everybody should really listen up. I'm at 3 Nephi uh, chapter 27 on the LDS website, uh, churchofjesuschrist.org. And uh, let's go here to the LDS gospel as announced by uh, Jesus Christ. This is what it says, Behold, I, Jesus Christ, have given unto you my gospel, and this is the gospel which I have given unto you. Okay, so then uh, at the very end of this, he says this. Now, endure to the end has been defined in the book Preach My Gospel as meaning to remain true to the commandments of God despite temptation, opposition, and adversity throughout life. And he that endureth not, un not unto the end, the same is he that is also hewn down and cast into the fire from whence they can no more return because of the justice of the Father. These purport to be the words of Jesus Christ. So if you believe the Book of Mormon is true, 
Okay, if you do not remain true to the commandments of God, despite temptation, opposition, and adversity throughout life, you will be hewn down and cast into the fire from whence you can no more return. By the way, a uh, a terrestrial kingdom is not in the Book of Mormon, nor is a telestial kingdom. This is talking about being cast into hell, like 2 Nephi 9.34, Woe unto the liar, he shall be thrust down to hell. Do you gossip? Do you ever stretch the, tr stretch the truth? Now, you just heard what Russell M. Nelson said. Take the words that your church purports to say are from Jesus Christ very, very seriously. And if we allow nicknames to be used or adopt or even sponsor those nicknames ourselves, he is offended. When I talk to uh, LDS people, at first they may say, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But then they quickly go into a nickname. They say the church or they say the members. And they'll even let slip the term anti-Mormon. Some of them will just say the antis, but a lot of times they will say anti-Mormon. And if we allow nicknames to be used or adopt or even sponsor those nicknames ourselves, he is offended. And there is, of course, the Mormon Museum in Provo. While growing up, I was taught that in order to have a testimony of Jesus Christ and his gospel, I also needed to have a testimony of Joseph Smith and whoever the current LDS prophet was. Take a look. A testimony of Jesus means that you accept the divine mission of Jesus Christ embrace his gospel, and do his works. In the LDS handbook for missionaries, they have about 67,000 uh, full-time missionaries out there. Uh, the book Preach My Gospel uh, gives a definition of three uh, words. Okay, pull that back a little bit here. And um, it defines the word gospel. And it says, God's plan of salvation made possible through the atonement of Jesus Christ. The gospel includes the eternal truths or laws and covenants. So when a Mormon says a covenant with God, that means the law the Mormon agrees to go under. Okay, the gospel includes the eternal truths or laws, covenants, and ordinances needed for mankind to return to the presence of God. And then uh, in 3rd Nephi chapter 27, verse 17, it says, If you do not endure to the end, you will be hewn down and cast into the fire from whence you can no more return. And endure to the end means this, to remain true to the commandments of God and be true to the endowment and to the endowment and sealing ordinances of the temple. So you are to remain true to the commandments of God. And it says this at the end, despite temptation, opposition, and adversity throughout life. So there you go. I want to put it here so you can see all of these definitions here. Okay, so um, enduring to the end means remaining true to all the commandments. Now, um, Romans 6.14 says saved Christians are not under the law, they're under grace. And yet, uh, Mormons are all about obedience to the law. And when I was a child, I was asked to read this book, The Miracle of Forgiveness, which is all about this. And I was even told to take it on my mission with me. So I did. So this video is going to be about what is the gospel of Jesus Christ? You know, is 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, the word of God? Do you gain eternal life by simply trusting Jesus Christ died for your sins according to the scriptures? That he was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures? Are you saved according to that gospel? Should we stand on that, that gospel like 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4 says? Or should we trust uh, Joseph Smith? and, uh, and uh, Mormonism. A testimony of Jesus means that you accept the divine mission of Jesus Christ, embrace his gospel, and do his works. It means you accept the prophetic mission of Joseph Smith and his successors.
In John chapter 1, verse 29, John the Baptist introduces Jesus Christ, and he sums up the whole mission of our Lord and Savior. Behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. And Jesus Christ makes it very clear in John chapter 8, verses 21 through 24, that if you believe in Jesus Christ, you, you, your sins are forgiven. That gift is given to you, and you will have eternal life. However, in Mormonism, you have the third article of faith that contradicts that. It says that through the, aton- that through the atonement of Jesus Christ, all mankind may be saved by obedience to the laws and um, obedience to the uh, LDS um, ordinances, which are rituals like getting baptized in water, getting married in the temple, uh, you know, doing things uh, such as this. While growing up, I was told to read this book, The Miracle of Forgiveness, by my then prophet, Spencer W. Kimball, who laid out a seven-step process to gain a forgiveness of sins. And uh, I want to show you a brief clip from um, a now-deceased Mormon apostle by the name of uh, Richard G. Scott, who lays out the steps uh, that one must, must take in order to be forgiven of any sin whatsoever. Take a look. Every incorrect choice we make, every sin we commit, is a violation of eternal law. Each of us has made mistakes, large or small, which if unresolved will keep us from the presence of God. Forgiveness comes through repentance. What is repentance? How is it accomplished? What are its consequences? These may seem to be simple questions, but it is clear that many do not know how to repent. In The Miracle of Forgiveness, Spencer W. Kimball gives a superb guide to forgiveness through repentance. It has helped many find their way back. He identifies five essential elements of repentance. Sorrow for sin. Study and ponder to determine how serious the Lord defines your transgression to be. Abandonment of sin. This is an unyielding, permanent resolve to not repeat the transgression. By keeping this commitment, the bitter aftertaste of that sin need not be experienced again. Remember, but unto that soul who sinneth shall the former sins return. Joseph Smith declared, Repentance is a thing that cannot be trifled with every day. Daily transgression and daily repentance is not pleasing in the sight of God. Confession of sin. You will always need to confess your sins to the Lord if they are serious transgressions, such as immorality. They need to be confessed to a bishop or stake president. Restitution for sin. Willing restitution is concrete evidence to the Lord that you are committed to do all you can to repent. Obedience to all the commandments. It includes things you might not initially consider part of repentance, such as attending meetings, paying tithing, giving service, and forgiving others. The Lord said, He that repents and does the commandments of the Lord shall be forgiven. I would add a sixth step, recognition of the Savior. Hello, my birth name was Gregory Brent Smith, but you can call me Han Radas. Han Radas is a Swedish name, and it means he is saved or he is rescued. Uh, My grandmother, Nana, was 100% Swede, so my father was half. And uh, she was the daughter of Jep Jepson. And uh, anyway, I'm making this because I want my, mostly my father, but also my mother to understand why I could no longer be a member of the group that calls itself the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Um, I'm also making it for my brothers and my sisters, and um, I'm doing this uh, out of love. And uh, I understand uh, some of them might not appreciate this video, and I will use the word Mormon 
Why? Because up until about 2018, uh, everybody in that organization uh, used the word Mormon affectionately. For example, in 1989, Ezra Tap Benson sang in general conference as the prophet of that group, I am a Mormon boy. Thomas S. Monson uh, made the movie Meet the Mormons and, the, and created the multi-million dollar campaign on a YouTube called I'm a Mormon. And if we allowed nicknames to be used or adopt or even sponsor those nicknames ourselves, he is offended. To remove the Lord's name from the Lord's church is a major victory for Satan. So one person comes along and says, you know, if you use that word, you're scoring a victory for Satan. And then people say, you know, uh, essentially, I, I, Captain. And it makes no sense to me that it was a perfectly acceptable word for 170 years. And if he's going to condemn people for using that word, uh, then I guess, you know, then I guess I'll stand with the condemned with Ezra Tapp Benson and Thomas S. Monson and Gordon B. Hinckley and Spencer W. Kimball. When I was a young boy, we had a book on our coffee table for visitors called Meet the Mormons. Okay, and I, I never felt it was a slur when somebody called me a Mormon. And I can tell you, I do a lot of missionary work. I will tell you up front, I have spoken to over 5,000 returned Mormon missionaries, about 25 a week for about seven or eight years now. Do the math, okay? Uh, so anyway, um, I'm making this because I know there are a lot of people like me who don't just want to throw away uh, Jesus Christ with uh, LDS bathwater. I also realize there are a lot of people that are watching this who believe that the Mormon church is 100% the word of God. So I'm going to be polite. I'm only going to use um, uh, LDS uh, uh, scriptures and doctrine and so forth. Know what you would call um, none, none of the so-called anti-Mormon doctrine will be used here. I'm not going to be sarcastic. I'm not going to make fun of anybody. I'm going to be polite. I just ask you, give this a chance. And um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make the claim that, um, well, Jesus Christ said in John chapter 8, verses 21 and 24, that if you die in your sins, you will go to hell. You will, you will search for Jesus Christ, but you will not find him because you will die in your sins. And uh, the Book of Mormon has an answer to that, and that is in Moroni chapter 8, verse 25. And it says you can get a remission of sins by, well, if you're a Mormon, you probably don't know. Why do I say that? Because I've asked Mormon return missionaries to fill in the, to fill in the blank. You get a remission of sins by what? According to the Book of Mormon by fulfilling the commandments. Now, before I ask him that question, I say, would you agree with me that only Jesus Christ ever fulfilled the commandments? And they all say, of course. And then they're shocked when I show them Moroni 8.25. Honestly, it's like they've never seen it before. So what does it mean uh, when a Mormon leader um, testifies of the greatness of Jesus Christ? If, if you can't get a sin forgiven, then how do you ever become clean and enter into the kingdom of God? Um, remember, Jesus Christ said in John chapter 8, verses 21 and 24, that uh, the people who were criticizing him uh, were going to die someday, and they would seek him, but they would not find him because they were going to die in their sins. And so they would go to hell. Now, on your screen, you see a picture of M. Russell Ballard, who's been a member of the uh, 12 Apostles, as you see on your screen, since 1985. And he's going to talk about how wonderful it is that Jesus Christ lives and that he can testify of Jesus Christ. But, but what does that mean if you can never get a, 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 a remission of your sins? Because nobody can fulfill all the commandments. Only Jesus Christ did. Let's listen to him. Some of you may need to study the doctrines more diligently so you will know the full significance of the covenants and the ordinances of the gospel. We must know his teachings and keep his commandments. I witness to you tonight that he is the Son of God. This is his church. The plan of salvation that we have been talking about is from our Father in heaven and our Lord Jesus Christ. 
The commandments are for our good, and if we will repent when we need to, and then live true to every commandment, we will surely rejoice when the day comes for each one of us to pass by the angels into the sacred presence of our Heavenly Father and His beloved Son, Jesus Christ. A third Nephi, chapter 27, verse 17 says, if you do not um, obey the commandments throughout, li throughout life, despite temptation, opposition, and, and adversity, you will be hewn down and cast into the fire from whence you can no more return. That is the definition of endure to the end, according to the uh, Mormon uh, book, Preach My Gospel. I believe that's on page 70 of the copy uh, that I have. Uh, so anyway, um, very, very, very quick story. Um, I had a couple of Mormon missionaries that came to my house and wanted to baptize one of my sons. I said, sure, you can baptize one of my sons as long as you can show me that you have a savior in the Mormon church. And they laughed and they said, oh, that is absolutely easy. So I had them come in, they gave their whole spiel, and I said, okay, my son, who's now seven years old, let's assume he turns eight and he does not want to get baptized in water by, uh, by a Mormon. I said, can he still have eternal life? You know, can he live with God in the celestial kingdom? And they said, no. I said, so he has to do his part when it comes to that. They said, yes. I said, what if he decides never to take upon him the um, Melchizedek priesthood or the Aaronic priesthood? Can he still have eternal life? They said, no. I said, so he has to do his part regarding that too. They said, yes. I said, what if he has lots of opportunity to get married to great Mormon women and he turns them all down and doesn't want to get married and wants to die a bachelor? Can he have eternal life? And they said, no, he would have to get married, in the, uh, married if he had the opportunity. I said, would he have to pay tithing? They said, yes. Would he have to attend his meetings? They said, yes. Would he have to give service to the LDS church? They said, yes. Would he have to honor and sustain his leaders? They said, yes, because those things are necessary to get a temple recommend, and he would have to go through the temple, and he would have to learn certain things, and if he refused to do that, no, he wouldn't have eternal life. I said, okay, so he has to do his part. There are certain things that Jesus Christ can't do for him. And they said, right. I said, okay, the deal was you could baptize him if you could show me you had a savior. What you have described as a partner I want my son to have a savior. I don't want my son to be part of an organization that's saying he does his part and then Jesus Christ does his part. I want my son to have a savior, not a partner. And, the, and one of the missionaries took his fingers like this and he leaned back and he takes this finger with this finger and he goes, yeah, that's what it is. It's a partnership. And I said, well, I'm sorry, you know, we had a deal. So I am going to make the um, argument in this video that uh, Mormons never get forgiven. It is impossible in Mormonism to ever be forgiven of a sin. Doctrine and Covenants 82.7 says, Unto the soul that sinneth shall the former sins return. Well, we sin every day, so the, souls, so the sins would be coming back to that soul every day. You know, and so, um, so I want to now play a clip of uh, Russell M. Nelson, and he's, it, it was given before Easter. Now I'm gonna show you a seven step repentance process really quickly before I show you that. And this is uh, according to uh, churchofjesuschrist.org uh, under the principles of repentance, which you can find in Gospel Principles, chapter 19. Uh, it gives seven things that a person must do to be forgiven of a single sin. I'll read them all, then I'll show them on the screen. Number one, we must recognize our sins. How many sins do you not recognize because you feel justified in your gossip or your jealousy or your pettiness or, or whatever? Number two, we must feel sorrow for our sins. Same thing. Number three, we must forsake our sins. Is there a single sin that you have forsaken completely in your mind and in your heart? No, then it says we must confess our sins. Okay, now the Bible says uh, we must, uh, we should confess our faults one to another, but uh, it doesn't say, it doesn't say to confess our sins one to another. And then it says we must make restitution. Then it says we must forgive others. And the final one that we must do, that we must do in order to gain uh, forgiveness of any sin, we must keep the commandments of God. Now I have this book in front of me, Miracle of Forgiveness. And on page 25, it lists about a hundred 
uh, sins that you can commit that can keep you out of heaven. Some of these sins, foolishness, gossip, anger, okay? That's just, that's, just, that's just some of them. Mormons, you're supposed to eat meat sparingly. Have you been to a Mormon cookout? Do they eat meat sparingly? Um, are you doing your genealogy work? 3 Nephi 23.1 has Jesus Christ commanding you to study the words of Isaiah, for great are the words of Isaiah. Now remember, if you don't keep the commandments of God, you don't get forgiven of any sins whatsoever. I am now going to play for you what for most Mormons is a very feel-good clip. However, it only feels good to them, in my opinion, because they are forgetting of the seven steps that a person must comply with, which I'm showing on the screen, to be forgiven of even one sin. And so Ruslan Nelson uh, gave this address in which he's talking about how wonderful it is, this Easter message, this, this message of forgiveness. As we approach Easter, my thoughts have lingered on one of the last moments of the Savior's mortal ministry as he was being crucified on Calvary's cross. The Redeemer of all mankind uttered these timeless words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. But, but as Mormons, if you were to say, okay, I'm going to follow the example of, of the Jesus Christ that I believe in, and I'm going to forgive as Jesus forgave. Well, you wouldn't have to forgive anybody unless they recognized their sins, felt sorrow for their sins, forsook their sins, confessed their sins, made restitution for their sins, uh, forgave others, and if they were uh, keeping all the commandments of God. Every Easter, we rejoice in the resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ. He is the epitome of forgiveness. The Prince of Peace will bring you peace. Jesus Christ is risen. He loves you. And because of Him, you can experience the joy and miracle of forgiveness. When I was a Mormon missionary, I told people that before we could baptize them, they had to give up coffee and tea and cigarettes. They had to commit to pay tithing and attend meetings, give the Mormon church a service, and to honor and sustain the Mormon leaders. If they were involved in any sort of a hanky-panky outside of marriage, they had to, to give that up or they could not uh, become a member of the church. Now, I'm going to read the gospel of Jesus Christ for you, and I want you to see if there is either a commandment or an ordinance mentioned uh, in the gospel of uh, Jesus Christ. So here we go from the King James Version. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. Paul writes, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. I had never heard this gospel one time while I was a member of the group that calls itself uh, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I didn't hear this one time. By the way, when Joseph Smith on the Hiram Farm got to this in 1831 to 1833, he and Sidney Rigdon didn't change a, a single word. They changed some... Uh, you know, semicolons to commas, but they didn't change a single word. So he says he's declaring the gospel, and he says this is the gospel wherein the saved Christians are to stand. He says this is the gospel by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. So if you believe the wrong gospel and teach the wrong gospel, it says you are believing in foolishness, you're believing in vanity. He says, for I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. So here's the first thing that you have to keep in memory. Number one, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. It says, two, and that Jesus Christ was buried. And three, that Jesus Christ rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So the gospel tells you to keep in memory three things. Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. This is the gospel by which you are saved. Yet the LDS third article of faith says, 
we believe that through the atonement of Jesus Christ, all mankind may be saved by obedience to the laws and ordinances. You are now going to hear uh, President Russell M. Nelson say that Mormons should have FOMO or fear of missing out. Fear that they do not gain life in the celestial kingdom or eternal life because they only chose to live the laws of a lesser kingdom. Now keep in mind they have never published the laws of the celestial kingdom versus the terrestrial kingdom versus the celestial kingdom. So how is anybody supposed to know what the laws of all these three kingdoms are? And even if you had a list of all those laws, there's more than 600 in Mormonism, how would you even know how to obey them without a how-to guide? So this is going to create fear, guilt, and doubt. Yet look at 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. For God hath not given us, saved Christians, the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Yes, we have a healthy respect or a healthy fear of God in that aspect, but generally we are not to fear anything, anything but God. And this is what Timothy is saying. God hath not given us the spirit of fear. And yet, you're going to hear Russell M. Nelson that say that you should have the spirit of fear, fear of missing out. This is not a general healthy fear or respect for God. No, this is a fear of missing out, of not, not gaining eternal life. Listen carefully. My dear brothers and sisters, Sister Nelson and I have looked forward to this evening for months now. Just think of it. Our Father created kingdoms of glory, celestial, terrestrial, and celestial, to provide a glorious place for His children. My purpose tonight is to make sure that your eyes are wide open to the truth, that this life really is the time when you get to decide what kind of life you want to live forever. Now is your time to prepare to meet God. Mortal lifetime is hardly a nanosecond compared with eternity. But my dear brothers and sisters, what a crucial nanosecond it is. During this life, we get to choose which laws we are willing to obey, those of the celestial kingdom, or the terrestrial, or the telestial, and therefore in which kingdom of glory we will live forever. Every righteous choice that you make here will pay huge dividends now. But righteous choices in mortality will pay unimaginable dividends eternally. If you choose to make covenants with God and are faithful to those covenants, you have the promise of glory added upon your head forever and ever. These truths ought to prompt your ultimate sense of FOMO <laughs> or fear of missing out. <laughs> you have the potential to reach the celestial kingdom. The ultimate FOMO would be missing out on the celestial kingdom. <laughs> Settling for a lesser kingdom because here on earth you chose only to live the laws of a lesser kingdom. So far, I have shown you the words of a former Mormon president, prophet, seer, and revelator, Spencer W. Kimball, his words from the miracle of forgiveness that are alive and well. You saw Elder uh, Richard G. Scott go through them. Not only have I shown you uh, Mormon President Spencer W. Kimball, I've played for you the words of Mormon President Russell M. Nelson. Now I'm going to play for you 
the words of Ezra Taft Benson, and he's going to make it very clear that to, that to gain eternal life, which is life in the celestial kingdom, living with God when you die, um, that it's all about obeying the commandments of God. And listen to the ones, listen to the ones that he specifically enumerates. And then after that, he talks about people that won't have eternal life, the terrestrial kingdom folks. And if you're a Mormon, listen carefully, because what he is saying should apply to every single Mormon that I know uh, to some degree. So take a look at Ezra Taft Benson. Today at this Easter time, I will speak a few words about what constitutes a valiant testimony of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Redeemer. A testimony of Jesus means that you accept the divine mission of Jesus Christ, embrace his gospel, and do his works. It means you accept the prophetic mission of Joseph Smith and his successors. Speaking of those who will eventually receive the blessings of the celestial kingdom, the Lord said to Joseph Smith, quote, They are they who received the testimony of Jesus and believed on his name and were baptized after the manner of his burial, being buried in water in his name, and this according to the commandment which he has given. These are they who are valiant in their testimony of Jesus, who, as the Lord has declared, overcome by faith and are sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise, which the Father sheds forth upon all those who are just and true. Those who are just and true. What an apt expression for one valiant in the testimony of Jesus. They are courageous in defending truth and righteousness. These are members of the church who magnify their callings in the church, pay their tithes and offerings, live morally clean lives, sustain their church leaders by word and action, keep the Sabbath as a holy day, and obey all the commandments of God. To these the Lord has promised that all thrones and dominions, principalities and powers shall be revealed and set forth upon all those who have endured valiantly for the gospel of Jesus Christ concerning those who will receive the terrestrial or lesser kingdom, the Lord said, These are they who were not valiant in the testimony of Jesus, wherefore they obtain not the crown over the kingdom of our God. Close quote. Not to be valiant in one's testimony is a tragedy of eternal consequences. These are members who know this latter-day work is true, but who fail to endure to the end. Some may even, may even hold temple recommends, but do not magnify their callings in the church. Without valor, they do not take an affirmative stand for the kingdom of God. Some seek the praise, adulation, and honors of men. Others attempt to conceal their sins, and a few criticize those who preside over them. The gospel is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. The Mormon church did not need to restore it. It's sitting right there. What they did is they replaced it with essentially what's in their third article of faith that, we, that says, we believe that through the atonement of Jesus Christ, all mankind may be saved by obedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4 doesn't have any ordinances, doesn't have any commandments. It says, if you will receive 
the truth about Jesus Christ, you will be saved. Three things, that he died for your sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Anybody can do that. Okay, the Book of Mormon says in Moroni 8.25, you only get a remission of sins by fulfilling the commandments. Nobody can do that. Moroni 10.32 says, you, Christ is only sufficient if you deny yourself of all ungodliness first. Only Jesus Christ did that. And only if you love God with all your might, mind, and strength. Only Jesus Christ did that. And so you have a vastly different gospel in the Book of Mormon, but the problem is Galatians 1, 8 through 9 says you got to pick one. You got to pick one. Because the Apostle Paul says if anybody preaches any other gospel than 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, let them be accursed, anathematized. And then he says it again. He says, look, if I come back and preach a different gospel, curse me. If an angel comes back, if anybody comes back, Timothy or anybody, doesn't matter. If anybody comes back preaching any other gospel, let them be accursed. And if you're a Calvinist, take a good look at that P and tulip, perseverance of the saints. It's For me, it's the same thing as the Mormon third article of faith. Anyway, this is why I walked away from Mormonism. I traded the false gospel of Mormonism, and I embraced 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. God bless you. Have a great day.